uh, thank you for coming, for so many of you coming at what the organizers themselves have told me is a, is a very bad time around about four o'clock, which is after most people have eaten, their blood pressure goes down and all they want to do is sleep. Um, so I'll start off you know, with the age-old trick of explaining a couple of anecdotes uh, so people don't go to sleep. A lot of people say, in fact a lot of people said to me, including English people but also some Spanish people, when I first came here and I discovered, uh, let's say, that there was a, a situation here, let's call it that, between Catalonia and the rest of Spain, they said, this is all a load of nonsense, nothing is going on here at all, uh, all the fuss is being invented by a minority of Catalan nationalists, they always use that phrase, uh, and that in, in reality uh, everything is absolutely fine here in Spain except for a few troublemakers. And, uh, well, I know that's not true, but it's very difficult to explain to people living outside Catalonia why that isn't true. So, to give you an idea of the kind of low-level conflict that there is going on at the moment between the Catalan area and the rest of Spain, uh, I always think, for example, of an episode, and it's one episode of which I could quote dozens that have been told to me or which I myself have experienced. It's 2006, we're in Burgos in central Spain. A friend of mine who works for a film crew has gone into a bar, a kind of restaurant bar. They want something to eat. Uh, three of them sit at the table. My friend goes to the bar. He orders everything in Spanish. He sits down with his friends. They start to talk about the shoot. And as they're Catalans, they're talking in Catalan to each other. Before they get served, let's say, even their, their, their first snack, the owner of the bar comes out from behind the bar, goes up to them and says, Si queréis hablar en catalán, mejor hacerlo en otro sitio. And all four of them are thrown out of the bar for speaking their own language to each other. Um, now, some people could say, okay, that's a one-off anecdote, uh, this guy was obviously a kind of uncultured, uh, uh, rude uh, person who understood very little, so uh, let me give you a, a second anecdote, much more recent, 2009. This was told to me by uh, Patricia Gabancho, who's an Argentinian journalist who also writes books in Catalan. There's quite a few of us, actually, as freaks, who foreigners who write in <laughs> Catalan. And, uh, two friends of hers went to the El Prado Museum in Madrid, one of the most famous art galleries in the world, public art galleries in the world, and uh, they were commenting a painting uh, in, in the uh, Louvre, Catalan friends of hers. Obviously, they were commenting on this painting in Catalan. And another art lover walked past them, overheard the language they were speaking out, and in the middle of the Prado, in the middle of the Prado, shouted out, ¡Hijos de puta catalanes! before going on to admire some more old masters. Third example, and perhaps the most, uh, the one that clarifies the situation most clearly, is uh, when a well-known writer here, a Catalan language writer called Empa Moliné, a satirical writer, uh, she went to Madrid for work. Her book was being published in the Spanish language. She went to Madrid airport, she got a taxi at Madrid airport, and as she was driving into the center of town, she got a call on her, on her mobile. Uh, she picked up the call, it was from a friend in Barcelona, and she started talking in, in Catalan to her friend. Immediately, the taxi driver turned around and said, Aquí estamos en España, aquí se habla solo español. Aggressively, rudely, and so forth. And Empa Moliné looked at him for a moment and said, Ah, I see what you mean. No, no, but I'm not speaking Catalan, I'm speaking Italian. And he just said, Ah, no pasa nada, pues. <laughs> so, there are three little anecdotes which give an idea of the kind of tension that uh, exists between Catalonia and the rest of Spain. Uh, like I said, these are three anecdotes, they mean nothing in themselves, but believe you me, they, they belong to a much wider set of anecdotes which belong in turn to a much wider frame of general reference. Uh, before, maybe I should just make uh, two things clear. Um, uh, before going on with the, with the rest of the talk to make it quite clear where I'm, I'm coming from. Two things. I've lived here uh, for 26 years. I don't have the right to vote. I don't uh, support any given political party in Catalonia or anywhere else for that matter. But in 26 years of living in Barcelona all year round, I have never once, not for an hour, not for a second, ever had the feeling, the perception, the personal sensation that I have been living in Spain. 
Now, when I say Spain, I mean Spain as most people are taught to know it, as that cliché of Spain that exists in most people's heads, even if they've never been anywhere near Spain at all. I certainly have never had the sensation that I have been living in Spain uh, in all these 26 years of living in Catalonia. The second thing, maybe, I would like to clarify is that I am not and never have been a nationalist. A nationalist in the English-speaking world and also in large areas of Europe is a highly negative word for usually, well, for, for several good reasons, you know, Second World War. It's, it's a negative word and which I identify myself personally with uh, exaggerated and potentially violent exaltation of the country that you just happen to have been born in. So I've never really been a nationalist and I don't support nationalist ideas in that sense in the way I've, I've just defined them. Having said which, I make only one concession to nationalist thinking, which is that, and I, I know I'm stating what British journalists like to call the bleeding obvious, countries exist. Countries do exist. I know because I was born in one. I was born in England, not in Britain, which is a kind of artificial thing because Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales have different realities. I was born in England. Uh, you were all born in a country, and I'm sure you know which one. Even people who move from one country to another know that they were born in that country and that they are going to live in that other country. Now, the only problem, the only time you get any kind of conflict over this perfectly common sense, shared sense of concepts, is when you get large numbers of people on a given territory saying that they live in a country which is not the country stated on their passport. Now, it's a situation that happens all over the world. Uh, but it is also the situation right now at the present time in Catalonia and has been for, a, for quite a long time. Mm, well, no, passports weren't invented till after the First World War. Certainly since the First World War. If they had been invented before the First World War, then, then too. Now, this conflict uh, can take all over the world. It can, take, uh, it can be violent, it can be political, it, be con it can be cultural, it can be linguistic and so on and so forth. In the last 300 years of Catalan history, it's been all of those things in, in different degrees, which we'll very quickly have, uh, very quickly have, have a look at. Um, before we move on to that, I would just like to say that I have never always been uh, accepting of Catalonia. When I first came to Catalonia, I didn't come to live. I came in the late 70s, 1978, 79. Uh, I came for a short stay. I don't think I stayed for longer than about six months. And when I came here, uh, I, I not only had no interest in Catalonia, I didn't know it existed. I didn't know there was such a thing as a Catalan language. I didn't know anything at all about it. And when my friends in the village where I was staying told me about, you know, the Catalan language and, and so on and so forth, immediately I rejected it. I wanted nothing to do with it. I assumed it was some kind of small, minority, unimportant thing uh, of interest only to a few um, eccentric professors in a couple of universities cities and maybe a few people living in remote rural areas of Catalonia. For me, a Londoner, uh, and, uh, coming from such an international city, in, in commas, because London isn't really that international, but coming here, uh, I felt that I had no interest and no need to have any interest in anything to do with Catalonia um, whatsoever. And if I change my mind, it's because I simply came in direct contact with the reality. I found that Catalan not only actually was a language, not a dialect, not a hybrid between French and Spanish, as some people say it is. It was a proper language. Um, I heard that it was used in a completely normal way by really very large amounts of people. And the more I found out about it, when I found out it was actually spoken by millions of people, uh, to date about 9 million people today, um, that's 1 million up from 30 years ago, um, 
uh, and also I gradually found out that it had, it was not only a language, it had also, like most other uh, important languages of any kind, had generated its own cultural universe, linguistically differentiated and completely viable uh, in music, in comics, in literature. It has the most extraordinary, extraordinary literature, Catalan, the Catalan language, way out of proportion, uh, in fact, to the, in terms of quality and quantity to the amount of people that actually speak Catalan. Um, so I discovered all of that. Later I discovered things. A lot of people are surprised to hear that it's now the 19th language on the internet. There are 6,000 languages on the planet. So for Catalan to be the 19th language on the in internet, some people find surprising. Um, anyway, like after all that, I kind of changed my view 180 degrees. I decided to learn the language. I learned it with this book, Teach Yourself Catalan, but also especially going out every day because I had no common language with these people. I spoke no Spanish. Therefore, the only way I could get a beer would be to um, order it in Catalan directly. So after six months, I uh, learned the language and uh, learned to speak the language. I then spent four years back in London uh, reading books in Catalan with a dictionary and then I widened my vocabulary and so on and so forth. But there was one other thing I liked very much about what I found after six months of living in the late 70s in Catalonia, which was my last objection to the whole Catalan thing, that it was nationalistic in the sense I've just described, closed, xenophobic, looking in on itself, was a completely false cliché. And that, in fact, I found that it was often the more Catalanist people I met who were simultaneously the most internationalist. They were the ones who traveled all around Europe. They were the ones who traveled to Africa and South America and Asia. Uh, they were the ones that were open to people coming into Catalan culture from other areas. In fact, their whole attitude was considerably less uh, closed than what I was used to hearing in England because, and this is for historical reasons, it's not because Catalans are better people than anybody else, there is barely any, uh, in fact hardly any, uh, an ethnic tradition in Catalanism or in Catalan nationalism. Uh, in fact, absolutely none. Their, their attitude, the attitude here towards uh, um, being Catalan has, is almost exclusively based on a question of language and culture. To give you just one example, one idea of that, one of the best known, this happened in 2008, a 28-year-old woman who was born in Morocco and moved here when she was eight years old. At 28, she won the most prestigious Catalan language literary award. Uh, also, not only the most prestigious, but the one which had the largest amount of prize money, which is the only reason I feel envious of her all the time. <laughs> now, Najat El Hashmi is now, two years later, at 30, uh, absolutely part of the Catalan literary scene. She, she was welcomed with open arms by the Catalan press and the Catalan media. Uh, in fact, they almost said, what we want are more people like this. We want more people coming on board because the more people that come on board, the more interesting and the more dynamic our culture is going to be. So that would be, uh, I mean, this compared to the English attitude in the 1970s is, is complete, you know, the, the English attitude at that time was still sort of, oh, well, you know, um, you know, things were much better in the 50s when we were all white. And that was really, uh, you know, so I found the Catalan attitude actually much more refreshing than the attitude I had been used to uh, living normally day by day in London from, from people in London and people in, in England generally. But of course, the question came up as to how, how did things get to be this way? Like, why was Catalonia like this? And why had I, who thought of myself as this incredibly well-informed guy, I was uh, 19 years old, um, 19 years old and married, and uh, I thought that I knew all I had to know about uh, things in, uh, in Europe. And here was an entire cultural universe on my own doorstep that I knew absolutely nothing about. So over these six months back in the 1970s, I started piecing together uh, to give myself a kind of image of how things had got that way. And I found, uh, and I'm just going to give you now the whole of Catalan history in about seven or eight minutes. Um, 
what I found was that I had been taught that in the peninsula in the 10th century, it was conquered by the Portuguese and the Castilians. The Portuguese came down the west side of the strip of the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, from what's now Galicia, and they created Portugal. And the Castilians came down from what is now Asturias, came down the central strip of the peninsula and created what is now Spain. Nobody had ever bothered to explain to me that on the eastern strip of the Iberian Peninsula, another bunch of people had come fighting their way down uh, reclaiming land for Christendom and themselves, mainly themselves. And they had come down the eastern strip, had taken Catalonia, the Valencian area, down to Alicante and the Balearic Islands, and that this formed, in fact, the third wave of the reconquest, and yet it had remained completely hidden from the school book or schoolboy version of history that I had been taught. Okay, then... Uh, I realized that I'd never been told about any of this because I was taught what anybody who is taught any history of Spain is taught, which is that Spanish history only really begins, and I always forget that exact date, um, always begins in 1469, which is when Isabel the Catholic marries Ferdinand of Aragon. Now, what I didn't know, because nobody told me, was that Spain was not unified in the least when these two people got married. It was a dynastic, a dynastic marriage. Ferdinand of Aragon was the Count of Barcelona. He was actually more important as the Count of Barcelona than he was as the, the King of Aragon. Uh, and that the two areas which were under the, their control maintained their own language, their own currency, their own laws, their own customs, their own cuisine, and they even maintained uh, tariff uh, customs duties between the borders between the two areas. So that this myth of the 500 years of Spain being one country was exactly that, a historical myth propagated by centralist and unionist Spanish politicians. Um, what happened after that? Moving towards the 18th century, it's like a weatherman, moving towards the 18th century, um, all over Europe there was a process of nation-state building, and the Castilians, being the most powerful single group in the Iberian Peninsula at that time, were no strangers to this concept, and they too began what was for them a perfectly normal process of nation-state building. Uh, and they had only... Uh, one problem, of course, which were the people who did not want to be involved. The Portuguese, on the one hand, they got away after a, uh, after, uh, a war, and the Catalans on the other. Um, the Castilians supported, uh, this all came to a head, a nasty head, at the beginning of the very beginning of the 18th century, when the Castilians opted for a centralist king, the Catalans opted for a more, what we would now call a, a king who believed in some kind of federalism, um, the Bourbons on the one hand, the Habsburgs on the other, there was a war that lasted several years. It ended with the siege of Barcelona. The siege lasted two years. The allies of the Catalans, including the English, abandoned them completely to their fate. And uh, the Spanish troops, the Castilian troops, aided by French troops, entered Barcelona, uh, as you probably know, on 11th of September, night 1714, which is why last Saturday lots of people were having demonstrations in Barcelona. It was the Catalan National Day, which celebrates the defeat of the country and the loss of all its freedoms. Now, from the 18th century through to the 19th century, we have a completely different situation now in Spain. Catalonia has been brought into the Spanish state by force. Uh, it's worth remembering it has never voluntarily joined the Spanish state. And uh, the uh, Spaniards, the Castilians, let's be precise, found them more and more and more irritating because the Catalans insisted on retaining their own language, insisted on retaining their own laws, despite all the decrees against it. So over the 19th century, over the whole of that 100-year period, the Castilians launched law after law after law, decree after decree after decree, to try and oblige the Catalans to be Spaniards. Uh, to give you just a couple of uh, brief examples of what this actually meant, um, if I can only find the, um, if I can only find page four. There we go. Uh, in, 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 um, in, when was that? Yes, in 1881, for example, any 
legal document written in Catalan from a testament to a tram ticket was declared null and void officially. Uh, in 1896, it was forbidden to speak Catalan. And we'd, remember, in 1896, the immense majority of the population did not speak any Spanish at all. They spoke only Catalan. It was forbidden to speak in Catalan in public places and on the telephone. Um, the year, uh, in 1923, all the streets and signs had to be in Castilian, that is Spanish only, and teachers caught using Catalan to their monolingual Catalan speaking pupils. These teachers were sacked on the spot if discovered. A year later, the architect Antoni Gaudí, international figure, he was arrested for speaking in Catalan to a policeman. They took him to the holding tank in a police tank. They threatened him. They threatened to beat him up. Uh, and it was only because he was a venerable old gentleman. This is what they told him that, you know, they didn't stick it to him. And he's, they said to him, in fact, they said, what's the matter with you? Can't you speak Spanish? Why don't you speak Spanish to us? And Antoni Gaudí, who, uh, belonging to the Catalan middle classes, did in fact know how to speak Spanish, uh, said, yes, of course I know how to speak Spanish. I just don't want to. So there we have uh, an idea of this conflict which exists today but which has a strong historical background. Perhaps one of the most telling quotes comes from 1907 from a Spanish military newspaper which goes, Catalonia must be Castilianized. People there must talk Spanish, think in Spanish and behave like Spaniards whether they wish to or not. Now in a nutshell, that is still the attitude of some very powerful people working in the Spanish centralized media and Spanish centralized government on both left and right, which is why we still have a problem today. There were some good moments. There was a moment of democracy, a brief window, five, six years, opened in the early 1930s when the Catalans got in there and reinstalled uh, their uh, the Generalitat, the Catalan government that had been taken away from them by force in 1714. It lasted six years because then a fascist dictator launched a civil war in Spain, came into Catalonia, and then things really got bad. Under Franco, and Franco was here for 40 years, uh, almost 40 years, 38, uh, the situation for Catalans was extraordinary, absolutely surreal almost as regards the use of their language. Under Franco, you could be arrested, you could be beaten up, you could be imprisoned just for chatting to people on your own street in Barcelona or any other Catalan town or village. There are documented cases of people being thrown off moving streetcars for speaking or for chatting in Catalan on them. Mm, and perhaps the case that for me made it so clear as to what it meant to be a Catalan speaker under a fascist dictatorship was explained to me by a man I was buying a table from a few years ago. He was, uh, in 1966, he was eight years old. He lived in a village at that time, not in Barcelona. He was told by his parents to take a little document to the, uh, uh, the town council, um, just a little errand that he had to run for his parents. Uh, as he left his parents' house, he was thinking in Catalan. He walked into the uh, municipal offices, and without thinking, he just walked in and said, Bon dia, good morning, instead of the mandatory buenos dias. The functionary stepped out from behind his desk and slapped this eight-year-old boy so hard he fell straight on his ass. And this is in the middle of the swinging 60s in Europe. So I tried to imagine what it would have been like for me to be eight years old, if I almost was eight years old, in 1966, and go in to the local borough council and say good morning and get slapped around the head for it. And only when you imagine that, if you can get that into your heads, then you can understand what Catalans put up with for 40 years in the 20th century and why there is still a big conflict here between Catalonia and the, uh, uh, the rest of Spain. Well, when Franco died, and he took his time, he died in the, um, uh, 1975, he, he popped his clogs, and... Um, after that, the, the Spanish government knew it had to show democratic credentials to the rest of the world, and it knew that showing these democratic credentials meant restoring and reinstituting some of the institutions, democratic institutions, that had existed in that brief democratic window before the Franco dictatorship in the early 1930s. Now, one of the most important of these was the Catalan government and the Catalan Statute of Autonomy. Now, the terrible thing was, at the time, that 
apart from the fact that most of Spain was against the restoration of this, was the military. The military was still obsessed, many of them still are, with the idea of a completely unified and uniform Spain. Anything that moves out of that, that could even make it look as if Spain was, was not one single unified chunk of earth, uh, they immediately started making, well, they, they started, uh, you know, waving sabers around. So, what the government decided to do is put in place what is currently the political situation or the political structure in Spain. They decided, they came up with this idea that as we can't just give autonomy only to the Catalans and the Basques, who were the ones who had it before Franco, we're going to give autonomy to absolutely everybody. We're going to give not two autonomous governments and two statutes of autonomy, we're going to give 17 of these things, including to regions of Spain, which not only never asked for one, they would never even have dreamed of asking for one. And there they were, suddenly they had their own autonomous government and their own statute of autonomy, 17 of them. Now the thinking behind that was that if you have 17 autonomous governments, uh, when the Catalans and the Basques start making their claims for more autonomy, they're going to have a limit on those claims because otherwise it's going to make the others look bad. So, in other words, everything gets watered down and that solves the whole problem. The King of Spain is on record of being so happy with this situation that he actually, you know, he, he opened a bottle of champagne with the then President of Spain, Adolfo Suarez, because he thought this was such a brilliant solution to the Catalan and Basque problem. Okay, so for the last 30 years, that's what we've had in Catalonia and what we've had in the whole of Spain in general, this, these 17 or, autonomies. And what people have discovered over time, especially in Catalonia, that this whole system of the autonomies is just a wonderful way for Spanish central government to have its cake and eat it. Because even the areas that, that they give control to of the Catalan government, um, if the Catalan government does something that they don't like, they just put in a decree and try and change it immediately from central government. So it's not federalism, it's not really even autonomy, it's not really one thing nor the other. And this process of haggling constantly with central government, lots of lawyers have got rich as Croesus out of this, by the way, as well, uh, has been going on for 30 years. It's been highly unsatisfactory. It hasn't made Catalonia fit better into Spain. And it, it's basically, it's been like a, a, a constant source of, of aggravation and, and political conflict. So, in order to solve this problem, and now we're getting right up to the present and why there are more people who want independence for Catalonia now than ever in its history, uh, is that the Catalans decided in 2005, the political parties got together and decided to draw up a new statute of autonomy, a serious one that would make Catalonia almost a semi-federal state within Spain, more or less the status which the Basque country enjoys at the moment. Now, they drew that up. It was approved in the Catalan Parliament 2006 by uh, over 90% majority of the people, of the, um, of the deputies. And it was then sent to the Spanish Parliament. And even in the Spanish Parliament, after a couple of tweaks, it was also approved and became law. And everyone thought, thank Christ for that, the Catalans finally can fit into Spain happily and we all know where we are and we'll accept that Spain is a multilingual, multicultural, multinational reality. And then the right wing Partido Popular took the law and said no, 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 and they sent it to something called the Constitutional Court saying it was unconstitutional. The Constitutional Court is made up of, um, about, I think it's uh, 12 judges uh, who are not precisely known for their political impartiality. They are highly politicized judges. What did they do? They took this law that would have solved everything in theory, they sat on it for four years, and then they released a decree which saying we do not accept the most, some of the most important, some of the most key clauses in the Catalan statute of, statute of Autonomy, with the result that this new statute of autonomy was worse in some respects than the post-Franco one, and worse in some respects even than the pre-Franco statute of autonomy in 1931. So the Catalans reacted. 
and they reacted in many different ways. One thing they started doing since the end of 2009 was they started organizing uh, ballots, unofficial ballots, uh, for independence. They started in one small village up the, up the coast of the north, north of Barcelona, and this has now taken place over 200 towns, cities and villages around Catalonia. Anyone on the municipal uh, register can vote in these unofficial ballots. Special attention was paid to the new communities coming in from South America, Africa and North Africa and Eastern Europe to encourage them to vote, yes or no, that was obviously up to them, but to vote and to participate because most Catalans uh, have a very clear idea that the, uh, they do not doubt that the future of their country uh, includes very much uh, these new communities within it and that without these new communities on side they won't be able to no one will be able to do anything so these went through again they're still going on by the way the final uh, ballot will be in Barcelona in 2011 April 2011 that's one thing they did another thing they did was have a huge demonstration just after the judges had made their vote 10th of July of this year one and a half million people went on the streets of Barcelona. That's not only the biggest demonstration in the history of the city, it's also the biggest demonstration in the whole of Europe since the VE Day celebrations in Paris. As far as I know, no one took a blind bit of notice of that. 50 uh, cities and villages around Catalonia even went a stage further and declared they were no longer morally bound by the Spanish Constitution and that in the future they would act outside of the Spanish Constitution if they felt it necessary. And finally, we have the, re the uh, emergence of um, two more political parties that are independentist. And um, to give you a... Uh, uh, a small quote uh, from the Vanguardia, which is a Catalan newspaper, uh, which is conservative and unionist. And uh, in July of this year, they ran a survey, and the question was, if you could vote uh, for Catalan independence in a referendum, a serious referendum, what would you vote? 47% said they would vote yes, 36% said they would vote no. What the survey didn't say was that of those 36%, the majority want a federal status or at least a lot more autonomy for Catalonia. But having explained all this, uh, for me personally, living here, what I find the most dangerous thing in all this, and the reason in fact why I too would vote for independence given half a chance, um, is that is this hatred, these flecks of hatred being spat at us from the rest of Spain. This is, these anecdotes that I've explained, I'm quite sure uh, are to do with the work of a, a minority section of the Spanish population. But without any doubt, and I quote a recent Catalan historian on this, José María Soleil Sabaté, the attitude in general in Spain, and, and this is almost, this, this has been investigated, is, and this is his quote, he said, it's a little bit like the attitude towards Jewish people in Austria before the Second World War. You couldn't really be a good Austrian and defend the Jews before the Second World War. And in the whole of Spain now, the attitude is a bit like that. You can't really say anything good about the Catalans and be considered a good Spaniard. This is the kind of attitude that has been generated over decades and decades and decades, as we have seen, of political and media manipulation. Now, that is an extremely dangerous situation to be in. Um, if Catalonia is left alone, defenseless, so to speak, that could turn into a much nastier situation. I've mentioned three anecdotes which really only involve a few people being sent out of a bar for being Catalans and other people being insulted uh, or told not to speak uh, Catalan and so on and so forth. But uh, I have also heard nastier anecdotes. I've heard um, groups of teenagers going to Madrid on school trips uh, who've been threatened with violence for speaking to Catalan to each other uh, on the metro, for example. I've heard directly um, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, of a Catalan taxi driver who went to visit with his obvious Barcelona taxi to Saragossa. His friends in Saragossa told him to take the taxi away out of sight because otherwise it would be trashed if people saw a Catalan taxi on the streets of Saragossa. And this is the kind of ambience now which is existing so that many Catalans, even myself, my, I speak Catalan to my kids on the street. At home I speak to them in this language. 
Um, but on the street, I speak to them in Catalan. So where I, I haven't been to Spain, in fact, for a couple of years. But when, if I were to go to Spain with my kids, I would not necessarily be insulted, turned out of a bar, shortchanged, etc., etc., etc. But I know that it might happen. They might hear us speaking in Catalan and tell us and, and something unpleasant might happen. I know it's, it's a possibility. So for that reason, I feel much freer traveling from Catalonia to Portugal or Catalonia to England or Catalonia to Holland or Catalonia to Germany than I do traveling from Catalonia to Spain. In fact, my, my personal perception is that when I move from Catalonia to Spain, Spain really is another country. I have exactly the same sensation. I'm not talking about political ideas. It's a personal sensation again. It's like when I move from Spain to Portugal or when I move from England to Scotland. You are in another country when you go from Catalonia to Spain. So, if Spain is another country, I reason, why shouldn't Catalonia be allowed to be one too? Is that 40 minutes? Okay, good, that's it. That's about it. That's fine. If there are any questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, I was, because most of my friends spoke Catalan, what was the question? Why, what, uh, sorry, the question was, when I came here for the first time, why, why did I learn Catalan first and not, not Spanish? Most of my friends spoke in Catalan, and I had an example there of another foreigner who had only learned Spanish. And therefore, what I noticed was that basically everyone he knew, including his own wife, had to change language in order to speak to him. Yeah. And I decided, well, I don't want to do this. You know, I don't care if it's a smaller language, whatever the hell that means, you know. Uh, I, I want to speak to these people directly in their own language. It was basically that, that kind of thing. And there were other elements as well. I mean, the, in 1978, everything was very confused. So Catalan people would say, oh, we're, we're so proud that you're learning our language. And then they'd go, hey, but you know it's going to be dead in the year 2000, you know, because everybody thought anything could happen, you know. Um, and the other thing was, and maybe that perhaps clinched it for me, the only Catalan who really wanted me to learn Spanish, and I know this is unfair to Spanish speakers because he was not representative of, in fact he was a native Catalan speaker himself, but he was a member of Fuerza Nueva, which at the time was the local fascist party, you know, he had brill creamed hair, he went around with a big Spanish flag in a car, he carried a gun, and I thought, now this is the only guy, <laughs> you know, who really wants me to learn Spanish first, so that helped as well. Um, well, I'm from Puerto Rico, so I see a lot of similarities with the case, even though our case is a bit different and things. But um, one of our major problems is that we depend so much economically from the United States, and we're kind of like this glorified colony. Then, what would be like your personal opinion regarding, like, could like Barcelona sustain itself without that help from Spain? Like, realistically speaking. Is it like so well off that it's its own thing that it can totally sustain itself without that help? It's funny you should, because Puerto Rico, uh, the linguistic situation in Puerto Rico is, is quoted again and again and again by Catalan writers and journalists. It's a totally different culture. Like when you're there, I, I don't consider myself American, even if I have right. an American passport. So it's like, yeah. you know, the whole, hardly nobody speaks English unless if you work in the tourist company or you want to study in the States or something like that. So it's like... Okay, or you come from London. <laughs> um, okay, no, the, uh, in fact, it's the, here it's almost the other way around. Uh, I don't want to get into the economic stuff, but um, Catalonia is the highest tax region in the whole of Europe at the moment. Uh, it's, I've seen the figures. I mean, the next one is Bavaria. By, by being highest taxed, I mean that 10%, little less than 10%, of the GNP goes out and hardly anything comes back. That's year after year after year. In Bavaria, for example, it's, which is the richest uh, uh, autonomous in federal uh, state in Germany and in much of Europe, it's 4%. So uh, the problem would be, could Spain get by without Catalonia? That would be the question, um, which is, <laughs> is one of the problems for them becoming independent. You had said something about how um, the relationship between Spain and Catalonia is kind of like um, 
is it, I guess, England and Scotland. Is that analogous? Like, would you compare it to that? Because well, only because it's still, you know, like when English people come over here and stuff and they go, yeah, what's all this Catalan business then? And I say, look, Catalonia is like Scotland on the sea, by, on the Mediterranean. And then, okay, that helps to get over the, you know, the, uh, because in Britain, as you know, uh, and this has been going on for about 10, 15 years, people talk about the British countries, you know, Scotland, etc. Uh, so that immediately kind of breaks the mold, if you like, for English-speaking people. But from then on, all the differences, there's loads of differences. I mean, in Scotland, they have another language, but it's spoken by about not more than 10,000 people, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et you know, it's, it's a different situation. Um, but yeah, that would be a, a, pa it's a parallel that you can use to explain the situation to at least the British people, yeah. yeah. And I can vote in the mock ballot. No, if it's a serious ballot, this is the irony, I have to have a Spanish passport in order to be able to vote in the referendum for Catalan independence. <laughs> but no, and I will, when, as, as a Catalan citizen, I was, I'm registered in, uh, as a Barcelona citizen, I'm registered, I'm on the Barcelona municipal uh, register and stuff. So when April the 11th, uh, 90 of 2011 rolls around, I'll, I'll vote, you know, I, ca I can vote and I will vote. Basically, it's the only time I can vote, you know, it's like, but uh, that, this, this is for these kind of mock ballots or, or unofficial ballots, which have a, uh, they have a symbolic and they carry some political weight as well. Yeah. Um, I hope I don't offend anybody and pardon my ignorance, but uh, when I first came to Barcelona, I, I've traveled in other parts of Spain and I didn't necessarily notice like a drastic change between uh, the rest of Spain and Barcelona. How can, how can we attest to that? Do you have an explanation for me? I mean, if it's not, if it's not such an obvious change, um, I mean, I, I guess, I guess my question is, why isn't there? If it's such a different culture, why isn't it so obvious upon first visit? Um. Perhaps because you, at the time, you weren't speaking Catalan or Spanish. I don't know. Um, but the first thing you know, I notice, for example, when I get back here, is that I'm suddenly able to use Catalan again. Just as when you move to any other country, you can use that country's language, whereas before you can't. So the first thing I notice is that I can, oh, I'm here. I can suddenly go, bon dia, voldria un café am blau. Um, besides which, the language differences? Besides the language differences, yeah, uh, I mean, everything. I would have said the geography, um, the, the type of architecture, the buildings. Um, if you, when you get to live here for a long time, you notice also the social structure is different and that's reflected in the layout of the towns and villages uh, because Catalonia never really had uh, a feudal system. Uh, so, you know, it has a completely different social structure. And, uh, of, yeah, I, for me it's just... It's just obvious, but no, hey, on the first, the first time I went there, like I said, I didn't know, you know, where I was. I didn't know what it was. I, I probably wouldn't have noticed anything myself the first time around. But then if you didn't have the frontier posts, would you really notice traveling from Spain to Portugal? You know, I mean, just on the first time, you know, if there were absolutely no border marks at all kind of thing. Uh, there was one, sorry. Um, are you concerned that like, um, any of these votes or the various demonstrations will be nothing more than symbolic representations of desires for freedom rather than actually instituting change? Because I know a lot of marginalized groups have this fear that they're going to continually ask for things and demonstrate and never get anything in return. Um, hence the reason why that's a resort to terrorist attacks. Um, so are you afraid that like, you know, Catalan, Catalan will just continue to ask for things and never really be taken seriously? Well, the, uh, the um, for example, to, to, to deal with the terrorist thing first, 
uh, there was a kind of Catalan ETA for a while, for about 15 years it lasted, mainly throughout. It was most active in the 1980s. It was, even then, the violence was symbolic, you know, it was to do with kind of blowing up statues or blowing up uh, uh, Spanish government offices and stuff when there was nobody in them. They killed one person by accident. They killed a lot more of themselves by, because they didn't know how to make the bombs properly and stuff. Um, but and the thing is, it was completely rejected by the you know, the immense majority of Catalan people. So that didn't work. So the idea, what has happened with these unofficial ballots, the first one was interesting because there you have this tiny village, Arrens de Moon it's, it's called, um, organizing this tiny little ballot. And the Spanish government gets so upset that they try to ban it. And then they try to postpone it. And then the Falange, the, the remainder of Franco's fascist um, uh, uh, paramilitary party, they turn up to the place. And this becomes international news. And the Spanish government starts getting so nervous. I mean, it's almost like Asterix, you know, I mean, this tiny little town. Uh, that then they changed their strategy completely and their attitude was to put out a lot of propaganda belittling and saying that none of this mattered and all the rest of it. But I have seen the people who are involved in these activities um, because when I go and, you know, if I, if I present a book, I, I travel around quite a lot and you end up talking to the people organizing these ballots and so on and so forth. And just the enthusiasm and the... Uh, yeah, how can you, the energy they're putting into this, you're talking about volunteers uh, all across the board. Many of these volunteers uh, have problems with their own city council whose political party doesn't want the ballot to take place and they just go on and on and on and do it, put in an enormous amount of work. And when you just see that atmosphere of kind of positive energy, if you like, all these people doing all this stuff, it makes you realize that this is not just purely symbolic, that it's actually to do with people on the ground organizing themselves, getting to know each other, finding out who shares a similar idea, and so on and so forth. So that in itself means there's now a whole network of organized groups that do not belong to any particular political party, and that in itself is quite important. It's also put independence on the political map in Catalonia. You know, there's even political parties which before would never have talked about independence now have to make it very clear where they stand on that issue, whereas before they, you know, they just hushed it up. Does that, and there was one well, more. I guess like, my question is more just, even if there is a vote for independence, like, what is the next step to get Spain to agree to it, despite, I mean, short of like an armed conflict or some sort of international like conflict? Because Spain never agrees to let Catalonia go independent, even if they're both independent. It seems like it's often not. No, it, the, um, the, there have been books that, that describing a kind of, you know, uh, political fictional uh, possibility, you know, what would happen. I could, personally, I think the most likely thing is that the, when independence becomes a majority uh, issue in the Catalan parliament, there will be probably maybe even within a very few years, uh, a unilateral declaration of independence on the part of the uh, Catalan parliament. By then they will have made contact with Brussels because there is no question of Catalonia remaining outside of the European Union. The European Union has m mechanisms on its uh, legal, in it, you know, in its, its documents for this kind of case. And my own guess is that one country before Catalonia is going to have to take the step, like Flanders or Scotland, and when that happens, things will move very fast. You know, I mean, the only thing we know in Europe about these, uh, about new countries being being created, because lots have been created in in the last 15 years, uh, is that things move very fast when they move. You know, it's like uh, in 24 hours, you've suddenly got another country on the map, and I think it's going to be something like that when it happens, <coughs> if it happens. <laughs> was, uh, sorry, there's you. Oh, that was your question, okay. Um, how difficult would the transition be like, bureaucratically to be, for Catalan to be independent? Like, would all of a sudden the police be like, oh wait, who's paying us? Um, oh wait, we don't have an army. Like, there's all these, would that be a smooth transition or that would be figured out? Well, I don't, I don't know. When, when the, um, yeah, when, when the Bosnian war was going on, there were graffiti up in Madrid saying Catalans remember Sarajevo. Um, so, you know, there, there is obviously some people who would uh, adopt a violent attitude to the whole thing. There's a Catalan police force. 
Um, most of the police here are either municipal or belong to the Catalan government. Very few are actually uh, responsible to the central government. So the police have already sort of, they're already on side, so to speak. Um, the military is another question. Um, when the new statute was, uh, was being debated, um, a high-ranking military officer in Madrid suggested that the only solution would be a military invasion of Catalonia. And, you know, Zapatero, the president, sort of sacked him immediately and stuff. But, hey, he'd said it. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but the statistics are more hopeful um, because the Spanish army now is not the Spanish army in 1979. Uh, the Spanish army now forms part of NATO. Um, it has to obey orders that go above the Spanish king, who is the official head of the armed forces. And in recent surveys, only 20-24% of the Spanish population outside Catalonia say they would be in favor of military intervention. So I, I don't think they would send the tanks in. But you never know. You know, it's, it's, people do talk about that a lot, about that possibility, because people still remember the 1980, when was it, 1981 coup d'etat um, very clearly. I remember it very clearly because my, a good friend of mine in the, this Catalan village, you know, he, he just saw what was going on and he just started packing his bags to go, you know. It failed, but you never know. You know, you never know. But I don't think it'll happen. I don't think there'll be any violence. Within Barcelona, it's kind of the language of more socioeconomic, like, I, I guess, a better socioeconomic situation because, like, a lot of people who, like, immigrated here from Latin America speak Castilian. And so I was wondering how you think this kind of dual linguistic identity could possibly affect, like, Catalonia's success as an independent nation, like, having it being kind of two things at once, like marginalized and yet a sign of like socioeconomic success, you know. Well the the situation of Catalan inside Catalonia is is really complex and uh, it's so complex that none of the, the, the cliches work, you know. Um, a section of the bourgeoisie is Spanish-speaking because they think of Catalonia as a kind of peasant language. Uh, another section of the bourgeoisie, or the upper middle classes, whatever you want to call them, are um, very pro-Catalan, but right-wing, conservative, but pro-Catalan, even pro-independence in some cases. But there are many working-class Catalan speakers, and the, the Catalan Spanish speakers, as I said, the Catalans who are monolingual Spanish speakers, all understand the language perfectly. So um, I've I've tried everything. I've tried being bilingual, which is a disaster because I learnt my Spanish six years after my Catalan, and it's my Catalan is internalised because I, I learnt it in six months through sort of every day going out and speaking in Catalan. It was very difficult, but it it made the language mine in the sense that English is mine. Uh, but uh, Spanish, I have to translate all the time. So for convenience, I, I have now for years and years and years, I use Catalan everywhere. You know, not the Spanish police, but everywhere, everywhere else, I use Catalan, and I've never had any problems. You know, ever. I mean, you know, Spanish-speaking, monolingual Spanish-speaking Catalans don't have any problems with being spoken to in Catalan at all. Some of them have like a kind of linguistic block. They find it difficult to learn another language or to speak another language, so they don't use Catalan. But basically, everything is in place. The most fac the fascinating thing, though, is the reaction of the, uh, the new Catalans, as they're now called, which is the 1,200,000 people who've moved into the country in the last 10 years, mainly from Latin America, Africa, North Africa, and Eastern Europe. And that is absolutely fascinating because uh, tens of thousands of them um, have either have learnt Catalan, are learning Catalan, or want to learn Catalan. And the attitude of almost all of them, without exception, is that they want their children to learn Catalan, even if they can't be bothered. So, because they see it as something important, they see it as important not only in economic terms of getting ahead and all this kind of stuff, but important of just not being foreign in Catalonia. And in my own circle of friends, for example, 
uh, just off the top of my head, and I'm going to miss a few, but there's uh, a Tanzanian woman, three Dutch people, uh, uh, a German guy, um, a, um, several Moroccan people, uh, a Peruvian, uh, well, I, I know quite a lot. We all speak Catalan. When, when, even when we don't have a native Catalan on the horizon, we speak to Catalan between ourselves, you know. It's our lingua franca, and that is a perfectly normal situation you know there are other situations but it's very normal so all that is kind of interesting and my my guess is that if it became an independent country people would just say oh well now it's serious you know so the ones that didn't want to learn catalan would would then go ahead and do it but it's here it's um it's an international language within its borders you know you've got people from all over speaking it Of the, uh, Germany, certainly. France would be against it. France, uh, uh, there's, uh, how many are there now? I think it's something like 55,000 Catalan speakers in France as well, you know, in the, because there's a Catalan, there's a French Catalonia. It's a small bit of territory which has Perpignan as its capital. And the French are, uh, I've talked to uh, a Catalan speaking French person. Well, he, he doesn't think of himself as French, but he's on the French side of the border, and he says their attitude is just, you know, totally centralist. The Germans, on the other hand, would be favourable, the Dutch would be favourable, the, all the small countries, the, the Baltic countries, the Scandinavian countries, the uh, stateless but influential countries in Britain like Wales and Scotland, uh, and Ireland already is favourable to uh, ideas of Catalan independence. Uh, Quebec on the international scene, there are lots of contacts going on all the time, cultural, political and so on, between Quebec and Catalonia. Um, you know, so Quebec would raise its voice as well. Uh, you know, thinking off the top of my head, those are the places that, that come to mind. Yeah, yeah, oh. sorry. <laughs> um, talking about the figures, uh, I think it was from July of this year saying that 47% versus uh, is it 36. Uh, and I think one of our professors here actually said that on one of the more recent surveys, it said that there was a seven point uh, switch hmm. where it went from 47 to 40, 36 to 43. And I was just wondering are those fluctuations normal or is it something to the point where you could say, like, I don't know what else has really been happening over the past couple months other than Spain winning the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you see? <laughs> and, and that explain the difference? I mean, do Catalan citizens kind of think, all right, well, maybe we do have something here. Maybe this is a point of unification. Because of the World Cup? Yeah. No, is, no. Like, you guys have been celebrating here like you've won, or is it like, all right, Spain uh. won? No, uh, okay, to answer the question backward, the World Cup, okay, like lots of Catalan people follow football. They have <clears throat> one of the best football teams in the world, um, Bar Barca, Football Club Barcelona. Um, and some of, a lot of their players in, were in the World Cup team. A lot of Barca players were in the World Cup team. So uh, fr I don't follow football very much, but a friend of mine who does very much said it was fascinating, an English friend, said it was fascinating listen listening to Catalunya Radio, which is the Catalan public uh, majority radio station, because you know, they knew that a lot of their listeners were not very pro-Spanish, but they weren't anti the Spanish team winning. So what they did on their broadcasts was sort of emphasize that most of the goals were scored by Barca players. You know, it's like a whole, a whole thing like that. But uh, the nasty thing was that when they actually won the World Cup, and this is something, um, there were incidents all over Catalonia, particularly in Barcelona and Mataró, where the... It's a, we're talking about a very small minority, but you're talking about those people within Catalonia, normally young people who support Real Madrid, who politically are very pro-unionist, very pro-Spanish and very anti-Catalan, and usually with an extreme right-wing uh, attitude. Uh, they did things like they wrapped themselves up in Spanish flags and gave fascist salutes outside Catalonia Radio. Uh, they walked around the streets of Mataró, this town up the coast where my friend lives, giving fascist salute and screaming putos catalanes. So, uh, you know, this was the reaction of the hardcore Spanish squad fans 
in Catalonia was instead of sort of saying, hey, we're all one, it was like, you know, fuck you, Catalans, you know, it's, uh, we Spaniards have been better than you, you know, this kind of, you know, the fact that it was Catalans scoring the goals didn't make any difference to them at all. You know, it was Spain had won and that was all that mattered to them. And that created a lot of Catalans who were quite happy that Spain had won the World Cup um, kind of had second thoughts, you know, when these incidents started taking place. So are those, I guess, getting, just getting back to the actual numbers, does that just, does that just happen? No, it's politics. Um, because the Vanguardia, which, as I, I made a point of quoting a Vanguardia statistic uh, in July, because it's, uh, um, like I said, it's a conservative and unionist, that is, anti-independence uh, newspaper, and they quoted this majority figure in July, and then mysteriously they, they suddenly decide they've, you know, another figure, and, you know, how do they get their figures, all the rest of it kind of stuff. It really depends on which newspaper you read or, or which TV station you look at. You'll get different uh, things. What is true is that the amount of people wanting independence has never been as great as it has up till now. Yeah. Okay. Is that, what do you reckon? They've Anyone? suffered enough. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you for the